and welcome to Building Great User Experiences. I'm Nick, this is Dawit. Um, we're designers on the apps team here at Esri, working with developers to create apps like Collector, Explorer, Navigator, and Workforce. We strive to create fantastic user experiences. And today, we're going to share an insight into our design process. You'll learn some techniques that you can use to bring design thinking into your own development workflow, regardless of the size of your team. And we'll use some specific examples from the redesign of one of our most popular apps, Collector for ArcGIS. So you might be thinking, hang on a second, it said ArcGIS runtime in this, uh, the session title. Well, what is the ArcGIS runtime? Well, it's a set of SDKs that allows you to build maps and spatial intelligence into your applications on a variety of platforms, iOS, Android, .NET, Java, Qt, and Mac OS. And in past years, we, this session has been very technology focused. You know, we've focused on things like how to integrate a map into your application, um, strategies for um, getting the GPS location from the device and, and how best to maximize battery usage and things like that. And you can check out these, those sessions uh, uh, online from last year and probably the year before too. Uh, this year, we're going to try something different. Um, we, we do use the runtime to build our apps, but to, the truth is, um, to build a great UX, you have to start, we always start with what problem are we trying to solve? Who are we building these apps for? And what do, what do, we, what do they need to do? It's easy to fall into the trap of starting with the technology, because the truth is, the technology is pretty cool, right? Like, it can do some pretty cool things. Um, and about 20 years ago, uh, Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference, the late, great Steve Jobs talks about Apple's strategy and the relationship between technology and customer experience. Let's take a look at what, what he said. Yes. Mr. Jobs, you're a bright and influential man. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> it's sad and clear that on several counts you've discussed, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I would like, for example, for you to express in clear terms how, say, Java, in any of its incarnations, addresses the ideas embodied in OpenDoc. And when you're finished with that, perhaps you could tell us what you personally have been doing for the last seven years. Uh. You know, you can please some of the people some of the time. But one of the hardest things when you're trying to affect change is that people like this gentleman are right in some areas. I'm sure that there are some things OpenDoc does, probably even more that I'm not familiar with that nothing else out there does. And I'm sure that you can make some demos, maybe a small commercial app that demonstrates those things. The hardest thing is, what, how does that fit in to a cohesive, larger vision that's going to allow you to sell um, $8 billion, $10 billion of product a year? And one of the things I've always found is that you've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And I've made this mistake probably more than anybody else in this room. And I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we have tried to <clears throat> come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple, um, it started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not, not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and, and figure out what awesome technology we have, and then how are we going to market that? Um, and I think that's the right path to take. 
And I think, you know, 20 years on, looking back, the strategies worked, right? Like, I mean, Apple, one of the most successful companies in the world, if not the most successful. So when you're building a new feature or a new app, think about the customer experience. What incredible benefits are you going to give your customers and your users? And there's three things to consider when you're setting out. Firstly, desirability. This might seem like common sense, but do people want this new feature or this new app? Within your org, sometimes there's a desire to create an app to do something. But the key is to focus on your users. I mean, the worst case scenario is you spend time building something that nobody wants and nobody uses. And one of the best ways you can find out whether something's desirable or not is to talk to people, conduct some user research, talk to your users or your potential users. The second thing is feasibility. You may have a great idea, but can it be done? You might have resource constraints, technical constraints. Yes, we don't want to start with the technology, but it's perfectly reasonable to do some time-boxed research or proof of concepting to try and figure out if the technology can do what you want it to do. And you've seen, you know, you can go to developerdialogist.com and see a bunch of, you've got a bunch of resources there to see what the technology can do. There's also runtime samples on, on GitHub. Final thing is viability. Does it make business sense to do this thing? Can you afford to do it? Building apps takes time and it takes money. And it's always worth weighing out the potential costs and benefits before you start out. And the most valuable design lies at the intersection of these three things. Um, desirability, feasibility, and viability. And later on, we'll talk about ways that you can learn quickly whether your idea has legs before you spend time building and launching your product. So quick show of hands. Who has heard of Collective for ArcGIS? And keep your hand up if you've used Collective for ArcGIS. OK, fair amount of you. That's, that's pretty cool. Collective for ArcGIS is our most successful mobile app. Thousands of people use it every day to collect and edit geographic data. FEMA use it for damage assessment after a natural disaster. E&J Gallo Winery use it to score the quality of their crops. So why would we redesign and rebuild this app? Well, this was a slightly different challenge from creating a new app or a new feature. And there were several cont contributing factors. The first being technical, technological advances internally within Esri. Some of you may know that we rebuilt the runtime SDK um, over the past few years from the ground up. And the old collector is still built on the old SDK. But what incredible benefits does that give to our customers moving to the new one? Well, first of all, better looking maps, vector based maps, more advanced symbology, smart, smart mapping, and labeling. And labeling is like a big ask for existing collector users. The second thing is, you know, collector is quite a mature product. And we wanted to look at improving, some of the, improving the user experience for some of the core workflows. We've been engaging with users, listening to their pain points, um, and we, we can make more informed decisions with that data. And finally, advances in the operating systems. So a lot's changed in iOS and Android um, since we first designed uh, and, and built Collector, things like the Google Material Design Guidelines, and obviously each, each version of iOS you know, gets progressively better and, and looks, looks different. So I want to design something new. Where do I start? Our design process at Esri has many different facets, from generating ideas, choosing the best ones, testing them out, and finally implementing. But it all starts out with framing the problem, developing a common understanding between team members, such as product management, developers, designers, and stakeholders. And over the past couple of years, several methodologies have, have emerged that bring together various aspects of the design process into a set of steps, kind of like a blueprint for designing and developing your product. And one methodology we found particularly helpful is called Design Sprint. And this is from the venture capital arm of Google, uh, Google Ventures. They provide seed and growth stage funding to technology companies. Dawit's going to explain a bit more about what a Design Sprint is, what you need to start one, and how the first couple of days will help you frame the problem and allow you to focus on the right things. Cool. Does that sound good back there? Good. Awesome. 
All right, so as you can see here, Design Sprint is a five-phase, uh, five five-step framework um, that helps answer critical business questions through rapid prototyping and user testing. So what's really cool about this is that the framework supports two types of thinking. There's divergent thinking, which is all about going far and wide, um, creatively brainstorming, generating a ton of ideas, and then convergent thinking, which is all about distilling uh, all those ideas down into maybe one, two, or three solutions that you really want to work on. All right, so at a really, really high level, guys, this is your basic product development cycle, or life cycle. So first, start off with an idea. You know, it's the problem that you want to solve. So then you have your idea, the little bit of design and technical implementation, you built it. So then after that, you launch. You get the product into the user's hands, it's out in the wild. Uh, and then after that, you want to learn from that. You hear feedback from your customers, um, which then in turn gives you more ideas to solve these problems uh, and improve your product. And so it's just a, a cyclical process there. So I want you guys to pay close attention to this graphic. I'm going to change the slides. Um, so what's really great about sprints is the whole process looks like this. Um, the sprints give your team a shortcut to building, uh, to learning without building and launching. Um, so you'll reach these clearly defined goals, produce deliverables, uh, and really gain key learnings quickly. Um, and it's really great because you're compressing what might be like months of, of work and development into like a week of time. Uh, and as you all probably know, building and launching something really costs a lot of money if you think about everyone involved and all the time. So sprints are actually a pretty good low cost option for you to uh, get to these critical business questions. Uh, so before you can decide if a sprint is right for you, you gotta set the stage and answer a couple of questions. First, you guys have the right challenge. You know, what do you wanna solve? And make sure that what you're trying to solve is something that users actually want and not something that you think is cool uh, because this way you can actually validate it later on in the process. Next, do you have the right team? So sprints are cool uh, because it's all about a diversity of disciplines sort of coming together and collaborating uh, in the room. So you have designers, you can have researchers or people that sort of understand the customer experience, developers, of course, product managers or owners, um, and so on and so forth. And sort of within the sprint, there's roles that people are assigned. You've got a facilitator or a sprint master that sort of time boxed the activities and keeps everything going. Uh, and then you've got key stakeholders that sort of help you, um, they help you guys when you're at like these stumbling blocks and you really need a decision to be made before you can move forward. Um, and you want to ensure that the people that you're sprinting with are not negative Nancys, you know, that you want them to really be all about uh, creatively brainstorming and bring positive energy to the group. Um, and then the last question is, you know, what do you guys want to create during the sprint? What are the deliverables going to be? So this can be clickable prototypes, it can be user journey flows, um, and so on and so forth. So at this stage, we've answered these questions. I'm gonna go over some of the processes at a high level because this isn't a talk on sprints specifically. Um, but I just wanna note and call out that just because these are predefined methodologies in a framework that Google Ventures has created, it doesn't mean that you actually have to follow these to a T. You know, we don't, you can definitely take bits and pieces of it and still extract value from it. So for example, when I say that, I mean sprints, for example, are typically five days long, but you can still do a sprint in three days and really get value from it. All right, so the first phase of a sprint is all about understanding. It's all about where we map out the problem space and create this shared pool of knowledge. It really establishes a baseline for everyone to start working from. So how do we do this? Well, there's a few ways to go about this. And uh, we'll include a link at the end of the slides um, to talk about more. So first off, you can have lightning talks. Now, you guys all know what these are. I'm not going to go into great detail. But basically, these should be given by the subject matter experts where you might discuss critical business uh, questions like the business cases, uh, competitor audits. If you guys have research already on your products, that would be great to review. And like I mentioned earlier, this really creates that baseline so that everyone's at the same level of knowledge moving forward. So during that process, you're taking notes, you've got ideas that you've been uh, working on, maybe writing them down on post-it notes. You can basically take these post-it notes, stick it on a whiteboard, um, and essentially 
group them together and you're looking for these like common trends. So as you see here on the screen, uh, all those post-it notes on the right are sort of grouped under onboarding and then on the left, all those post-it notes are grouped under the common theme of seamless experience, for example. Um, so really what this does is create like a heat map of commonalities and sort of helps you uh, hone in on what you want to focus on for the, the critical business questions. And then something that we particularly like uh, are journey maps. So in this example, there's a sort of bottom left, you'd see the GIS admin is a type of user that we were doing a journey map on. And uh, we wanted to step through their experience towards completing a specific task. So on the far right, you can't see it, but it actually says, I think it says end. So that's the, that's the end task that we want that GIS admin to complete. And on each of those post-it notes is each step of their journey through that process. And we sort of just draw lines and connect them to help essentially create like a map-like visualization. So these are really great because they help uh, illustrate like the pain points because, I mean, how often are you stepping through, really going step-by-step step through your product uh, from the viewpoint of a customer? Uh, so it really helps you identify where solutions can live. Um, and one of the best reasons to actually create journey maps, we think, is that they help you prioritize critical points and areas that you need to focus on and deprioritize those edge cases, um, which can really be a huge time suck. And in a sprint, that's not really what you want. So I'm going to hand it over to Nick. So how do we approach the collector redesign? Um, as you can see, collector, the existing collector can do a lot of things. There's a lot of features in there. It's quite a mature product. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, thousands of people using this thing every day. And the last thing we wanted to do was change things for the worse. Um, so you could look at that, it's pretty daunting. It's like all these things to redesign, all these users to satisfy. Um, but actually, the amount of users is a great advantage. Um, we're not guessing. We know how people are using the product. We know what they're using it for. We've been talking to them. We've been actually gathering analytics on how they're using the product. For example, in the last two and a half months, two million features have been collected with Collector, and 85% of those features were points rather than lines or polygons. So if we can analyze and improve the point collection workflow, we thought this would be a good place to start. So what is the point collection workflow? Um, as I mentioned, we talked to customers about their pain points. We also did an in-depth critique on this core workflow looking for usability improvements. Let's take a look now at this workflow in the existing app, Collector Classic. So put your hand up if you have never used Collector before. OK, from you guys, how, I've got my Collector map here, which I created to collect food truck locations. Um, the first part of the point collection workflow is start, to start collecting. Can anyone, from those people that have never used it before, how would I start collecting? Can someone shout out? Plus symbol. Plus symbol. That's, that's Awesome, actually. You got that straight away. Um, as you can see, the plus symbol is up in the top, in the middle of the nav bar at the top there. And it's actually intermingled with other tools, such as the search tool and the GPS tool. Um, so in, in some respects, because it's, it's intermingled with those other tools, it's kind of not as discoverable as it potentially could be. Um, it's kind of the primary control of this app, right? Like you're using this app to collect data and it being kind of intermingled with those other tools could be problematic from a discoverability perspective. There's one other issue here about it being right up at the top of the screen and that's ergonomics. So if I'm out in the field and I'm holding the phone with one hand, trying to reach up to the, to the top of the screen is actually pretty difficult with my thumb. And so it really requires two hands in order to, to start collecting. The second part of the point collection workflow is choosing a type of feature. So let me just hit the plus button. This takes me to a full screen view where I can choose the type of feature I want to collect. And a full screen view is actually a pretty reasonable design choice here. Potential problem with that? Well, you've lost a little bit of context, right? You can't see the map anymore. Um, 
but actually the list looks pretty good. I've got like a, a little swatch of the symbol for each feature type and the name of the feature type. Um, and the list is pretty scannable, but actually if you look at it a bit closer, there's one piece of information that's repeated on every row, and that's the name of the layer, Foo Trucks. And that, that's actually making the UI a little bit busier than it potentially could be. And it's, you know, maybe making the list a little bit less scannable than it could be. Um, so the next, next part of the point collection workflow is to set the geometry. Now, I've chosen the type of feature to collect, like a burrito, burrito food truck. And you'll see this takes me to a form view. And then the first row of this form view says location and there's a lat and a long. So what's happened here? I didn't really do anything to, to set a location. Um, what's actually happening here is actually pretty cool. It's actually what we found from talking with collector users is they're usually collecting at their current location. So rather than forcing them to set, the, set that location, we just set it for them. We, we default to um, your current location by using the GPS location. But hang on a second, I can't see any map. Like, how do I check to see, you know, where the where the the, the feature is on the map? And actually, what if I didn't want it to be at my current location? Well, again, up on the in the middle of the navbar, there's a little icon that I can tap to toggle between a map view and a form view. And when I'm in the map view, if I zoom in, the proposed location is represented by a a little red dot. And if I tap on the map, I can actually set the location um, for the feature. Now again, like when I'm tapping on the screen, my finger's kind of getting in the way, actually, of the location that I'm trying to set. So if, I'm, if I really want to set something precisely, um, how do I do that? Well, for new users, they might not know this, but for seasoned collector users, they would know that there's a long press gesture that I can use, which will reveal a magnifier, which allows me to set the location a little bit more um, precisely. So for, for new users, this is all kind of learned behavior, right? Like I need to know that this location is set for me. I need to know how to get to the map. I need to know that I need to tap on the map to set the location and the whole long press gesture to reveal the magnifier. The next, next thing I need to do in the point collection workflow is set or edit attributes. And each attribute is represented as a row here. And when I tap on one of these rows, it takes me to another view where I can actually enter the information. Now to get out of this view, I need to hit the done button in the top right, which takes me back to the form. That seems OK. but Actually, imagine if this wasn't four attributes, but 50. You're now introducing a lot of extra taps by navigating from this form view to this other, to another view where, where you actually set the values. So editing attributes, there's too many taps. And this is actually a bit of feedback that we got directly from customers that there are too many taps to achieve this particular task. And also for other tasks like, I'm not going to show it, but for Ooh. I'm not going to show it, but for actually uh, adding attachments, um, that was another bit of feedback that we got. And finally, when I want to submit this feature, um, if I want to submit the feature, I just tap the submit in the, up on the nav bar. And this shows me some feedback. Um, it lets me know that the updates are sent. So um, showing the feedback, that's a good thing, right? So this is, this, this is basically critique. You know, by stepping through that workflow, um, we, we've done some critique. We didn't try and solve any problems there. We just looked at how the app was in its current form and looked at potential areas we could improve. And also things, you'll notice I mentioned things that we actually liked along the way that we didn't want to lose. And critique is a fundamental part of design and collaboration. And I'll loop back to that later. 
So up until now, we've talked, we've talked a lot about framing the problem. This is incredibly important. But now we're actually going to drive towards a solution. And we want to generate ideas, potential ideas, to solve these problems. And it starts out, like what, du like what Dewey said, is it starts out with divergent thinking. Initially, it's, try it's, it's best to try and generate as many ideas as possible, because this maximizes your chance of finding the best solution. And one of the key tools we use for this is sketching. It's quick. It's easy. You can do it alone. It's disposable, and anyone can do it. It doesn't have to be limited to, to designers or people that can draw. If you can draw like primitive shapes, like circles, triangles, rectangles, and wavy lines, that's all you need. And it allows you to really focus on the details that are necessary to illustrate your point. And regardless of the magnitude of the design task, we always start out with sketching. These are some sketches I did for um, trying to think about ideas for how collect, the collect tool should work on a tablet. And technology can help. You'll notice, actually, this is, these are sketches I did on an iPad. Um, sketching on an iPad is actually really efficient. It allows you to copy certain elements and paste them. Um, and actually, the more you sketch, you'll find actually it gets the creative juices flowing and the more ideas you'll come up with. But actually, group activities are an even better way to generate more ideas. You've got a broader cross-section of people, whether it be demographics, personalities, subject matter experts, or even stakeholders. And involving stakeholders earlier in this, early in this process actually provides them context for the eventual solution. And then you'll get more buy-in. So six years ago, six or seven years ago, um, a typical design session for, uh, within Esri, within our team, would be sat in a room with the designers and the developers with a whiteboard, drawing up ideas for how this particular feature should be. And during the day, you wipe away ideas, you draw up some new ideas. And then at the end of the day, what would happen would be what was left on the whiteboard typically would be the design that got implemented. And there's some, there's some problems with whiteboarding, actually. Firstly, you know, you've got to be confident enough to step up to the whiteboard. Not everyone is. Um, it can typically, dom more dominant characters tend to take over a little bit. We all know that guy at the whiteboard that, you know, won't put down the pen. Um, and it can lead to a little bit of group think and, and design by committee. And as I mentioned, the last idea typically wins. All those ideas that you rubbed away, they've been lost. You know, how do you get those ideas back? They might have actually been you know, ideas that were, were pretty good, actually. Um, and I went down to a conference down in Boston called UI18. And I attended a session called Discussing Design Without Losing Your Mind. And it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody try and put a structure around this process and around design discussions. And it's centered on two key things. The first being critique. Now, we've already talked about critique. We already did a little critique of Collector. And anyone who's been involved in building software will have probably have received critique at some point. Maybe you've heard things like, no, that won't work. What if we did it this way? It would be better if you moved that button over there. Or maybe even, what the hell is this? Critique's not really about that kind of feedback. It's more about critical thinking. It's about objective focus. It's being about being objective focused. What was the designer trying to achieve? How did they try and achieve it? How effective were their choices? And why is it effective or not? And they gave gave some the guys giving this session gave some tips about giving critique. Um, so don't assume. Find out the reasoning behind the design thinking, the constraints, or other variables. Lead with questions. Show an interest in their process. Talk about the strengths. It isn't just about the things that aren't working. And avoid problem solving. This is a key one, I think, especially in group discussions, because if you start problem solving during a critique, you're no longer focused on the solution that's being critiqued. And inevitably, people in the room will start thinking about 
another solution. And, and if they vocalize that, um, other people in the room start critiquing and thinking about problems with that solution. And there may be even f more people in the room that will start thinking about other ways to solve that problem. So in order to keep focus, always try and keep analyzing the solution that's in, in front of you instead of problem solving. And when receiving critique, you know, this takes humility and restraint. Critique's about understanding and improvement, not judgment. So remember the purpose. Think before you respond. Do you even understand what your critics are saying? And participate. Analyze your proposed solution with everyone else. So that's critique. It's really just a tool, and it's, it's really good for, for collaboration on ideas. But the other piece that these guys talked about was something called Design Studio. Now, this is a group exercise where you focus on a single scenario and make sure you frame the pro problem first and everyone has that common understanding. And it actually allows you to take the divergent thinking and use critique to converge on one or a handful of ideas that you feel are the strongest in, in the, in the, on the team. And it's an extremely powerful way to build consensus. We've used it in-house for UI design, for apps, for web apps, um, and even for API design. And this is how it works. It's really just three rounds of sketching, presenting, and critique. So the first thing you do, everybody who's involved in this design studio will take the scenario and individually start sketching as many ideas as they can in, in order to solve this problem. And this is a time box activity, five to eight minutes. Then each person gets a chance to present and explain their sketches. And finally, the rest of the team um, has a chance to critique, saying what they liked and, and where they feel the solution could be improved. And then you do it again. Except this time when you sketch, you can actually steal other people's ideas. So you've heard about what people felt was strong, um, and you can incorporate that into your next round of sketching. And then you do presentation, and then you do critique. And you do that three times. And what you'll find is, throughout, through the individual exp exploration and the critique, you will actually find that you'll refine you'll get group refinement. You'll get that convergent thinking around the strongest ideas. People's sketches will start looking more and more alike, and you'll be building consensus at that point. It takes time, planning, facilitation. And if you're following the design sprint that Dewey mentioned earlier, you'll do similar activities on day, days two and three. It varies slightly, but it's similar. It's not always applicable, so smaller design tasks might not need it. Um, there might be existing paradigms, existing ways of doing things that maybe don't need a lot of you know, exploratory thought. And it, the goal of it isn't to find a single solution, but a handful of ideas that you want to test out. And you won't know if you, they have legs until you test them out. So I'm going to hand over back to uh, Dawit to tell, tell us how we would test out these ideas. Let's do it. All right, so Nick took us through generating a bunch of ideas by sketching and then critiquing. Um, and we've already like, framed the problem, sort of got to the shared knowledge base. Um, so now we have a couple of ideas and sketches that we feel might be like, best to work on. So let's prototype. Uh, the goal here, guys, is to gain insight really, really quickly. You know, we're validating or invalidating these ideas as quickly as possible. Um, so if, for example, if you're still thinking about this within the context of a sprint, a design sprint, uh, this would basically be the penultimate day, so day four or five. All right, so how do we do this? Um, so I'm going to basically borrow something from Apple's WWDC 2014 session Nick shared with me recently. It's really cool. It's called prototyping, fake it till you make it. So they have this really simple prototyping process that I liked. It all starts out with, making fake apps. And then we show people. And then we learn from their feedback, because we never we get that. And we make some more fake apps, we show people, we learn. So let me unpack that a little bit. So you got to ask yourselves, what can we fake? So when I say faking, uh, 
<laughs> Basically what that means is you can help save time uh, when you're prototyping by, let's say, using images or screenshots uh, for parts of the UI. So if you were doing a web app, you don't need to actually design the Chrome browser bar. You can just screenshot things and pull it in. If you were doing a mapping application, which you probably are, you can just screenshot a map from ArcGIS Online and pull that into your design. It's, it's no big deal. You can basically fake everything that people that are going to be testing this aren't going to use. So everything you don't want feedback on. And then you got to think about where are people going to use it? You know, uh, you want to make sure that this prototype is something we can try out on the right device and in the place that people will be using it. So we do field apps. You know, it sort of makes sense to be able to prototype something and have it run on a phone that we can take outside and have it still work. So by far and away, the most common tool that we use, I'm going to get lightly into tooling here, is a UI design tool called Sketch. Um, it's sort of the de facto industry standard. Uh, and up until recently, we used it for strictly visual mockups. Um, but they recently, I think within like the last two weeks or so, added functionality to make clickable prototypes within there. Um, so all you do is basically create, like a, you drag out a space that's basically a tappable target and you, uh, take, it takes you from screen to screen. So uh, we can prototype that. Um, and I can show you what that looks like really, really quickly. I'm just going to, it's almost just like a preview here. All right, so this is what Sketch looks like. Um, and if you're familiar with Explorer, this is just like a really, really basic version. Um, so I've got your maps here. And let me stress that these are just, these are just mockups. This isn't anything actually technical. This isn't code. Um, so basically, I wired these two screens up. This is your browse view where you've got all your maps. And then this is your map view. Uh, and this is literally just this map is a screenshot here. Um, and so is this dot. Like, it's all faked. Um, so the idea is here that I can select this element um, and basically link it to this screen right here, the map view. Um, so what that does is when I tap that element, I'll be taken to the map view. And then conversely, I linked up this back button here to take me back to the browse screen. And then you can basically preview this on a device and take it outside really, really simply. Like if I just tap this here, I can go back to the browse. Nothing fancy. Um, but there are some tools that let you get pretty, pretty complicated with it. Um, so that's all I wanted to show you there. Um, so if you want some other options other than Sketch, there's a design agency called Cooper Design. Uh, they have this really cool matrix of all these different prototyping tools. And if you can kind of see that they sort of are like sorted by um, what's easiest to use, like what's, what you can work on fastest. Um, what's best for user research, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just one of many tools. I'll just let that see some photos going on. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, sorry. Jeez. <laughs> um, all right, and we'll have links at the last slide as well for resources for everything that you see here. All right. So you might be thinking at this stage, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, I don't know. It's kind of a lot of tools. I don't know if I really need that, you know. I can probably just stick with my paper prototyping like we just did when Nick took us through. That seems to work. Or I can just wireframe things really, really simply in black and white. Why do I need to use some other tool? So just remember these things, guys. Low fidelity, which is paper prototyping, sketching, things that don't have a lot of detail, can actually lead to false positives when it comes time to testing. You know, if the product doesn't look real, the customer response probably won't be real. So. And the other argument is um, the time argument. You know, if using another tool takes a lot of time, well, let me offer this. If you have to, if your prototype has to be realistic enough for people to actually use and feel like it's real, and you're sketching things, you really have to spend a lot of time to try and make it look good and feel and feel good. Um, so honestly, I challenge that and say, how much time are you actually saving by doing low fidelity prototypes? And then the last thing is. Utilize the material design guidelines in the, in the HIG, the Apple Human Interface Guidelines. I mean, there's a lot of time and effort put into these guidelines um, for really successful apps, obviously. Uh, and it can be really easy to get caught up in how a button looks, the color of something, you know, when you're designing things. And that's really not what this is all about. That's not going to help you solve the problem, these critical business questions that we mentioned earlier. So in these guidelines, there's a lot of really great components in there. And if you use a tool like Sketch or Photoshop or some other ones, 
you know, there's libraries and templates out there. You can just drag and drop them into your file. And so you really don't have to do much um, at all. So it's really quick. And if the other argument is, well, I don't know if I can justify additional tools financially with my org. Well, if you're doing a sprint, you know, it's only a couple of days. A lot of these tools have free trials, so you can just grab them and, and use them. And Sketch is really cheap. It's only about 99 bucks for a de facto industry standard tool. That's pretty affordable, I'd say. All right, so I'm not gonna get too into this in the interest of time, but after prototyping, I mentioned we've gotta, we've gotta show people our apps and get their feedback. You know, users are the ultimate judges, honestly, of whether a product is good or not. You know, we don't make it for ourselves. So, you know, we wanna show them these fake apps and get their feedback. Um, and I just wanna call out that the validation phase is the last day of a sprint, typically. Um, so Nick's gonna tell us a little bit more about how they validate in Collector. Yeah, so you're watching some video, video footage here from usability studies we did, we did on the new experience for collecting data. We designed and built two prototypes and invited 24 users to our Redlands campus to participate. And observing real users was a fantastic way for us to learn and iterate on the initial design before we shipped anything. And we didn't build the fully functioning app, but we went one step beyond some of the stuff that Dawit was talking about. Um, we did write some code, but just focused on the key collection workflows, things that we were really trying to nail down. It was important for us that things like setting the location felt real and actually was real. You are collecting at your current location. We wanted to be able to take it outside in a real world environment rather than just being sat in an office somewhere tr like testing it out. And we learned a lot. It took actually a while to analyze the results that we got. Um, and following it, we made a bunch of refinements and changes. And a lot of the time you will need to rethink after you've done prototyping. You'll need to do more studies, but ultimately you'll get to a point where you feel the solution is strong enough to start writing some code for real. What was interesting though is some of the things we learned weren't actually really tied to the point collection workflow that we were, we prototyped. For example, um, most of the collector users when they were filling in the attributes didn't use the keyboard, they used voice to text. Now that was really a really interesting insight because it, it kind of makes you think, well, maybe there are other areas of the app that, where we need to use voice to text to try and kind of, or voice commands to try and kind of improve that experience. So I'll hand back to Dawit to talk about the next stage, which is implementation. Right, so when we talk about design, um, you know, not many people actually talk about the implementation phase, specifically the interaction between design and development. Um, and that's kind of weird because, I mean, Implementation is all about making your designs real, after all, and, and tangible. Um, so what's next? You know, we might hand off designs to a developer, and then maybe a few hours, days, or weeks later, they write the code, they send you their implementation. Prop it. We're good, right? It's that simple, right? I saw some nods. All right, you guys are all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for a little reality check. So you probably know, a decent amount of you at least, that implementation rarely goes off without a hitch. Um, so why is this? Well, I mean, feasibility, first of all. You know, sometimes aspects of a proposed design can't actually be implemented, you know? There might be constraints with the technology. So in that case, you've gotta compromise and maybe start thinking about how you're gonna redesign. Uh, and it happens all the time, and it's, and it's hard to know um, until implementation if something's actually gonna be problematic technically speaking. So viability. Um, we've had this happen, you know, developers will mention that parts of a proposed design that maybe take longer, you know, or you know, sometimes they question if it's actually really necessary or if we really need this thing. Um, so that's another thing that can come up and then you start rethinking and then maybe sometimes you go back to the drawing board. So that's part of implementation for sure. And then understanding, you know, this is threefold. Um, so the design isn't gonna spell out every line of code. I mean, that would be nice. Some things only come up during implementation, you know? 
Like for example, it can be hard to remember every single error state you need to handle in a design, um, or what happens, or what should we do when X happens, you know? The other thing is, does the development or the implementation match up with the intent of the design? You know, is what the developer has given me actually what I, actually what I designed? Um, so there's back and forth there. And then the last part is now that you've tested the build, does your design still make sense? You know, sometimes designs look or work better in a prototype than they actually do on the device. Um, so really, it's important. Communication is key, specifically between design and development. And you all know that software development is iterative. So this is OK. It happens. So I'm going to pass this back to Nick, who's going to talk a little bit more about Aurora. So Collector Aurora is the code name for the new collector. And we're still iterating. We're in beta on iOS. Um, so if you want to join that beta, it, that's, that's open. Come chat to me afterwards. Uh, and we're still developing it on Android. Um, and we saw earlier how we analyzed the point collection workflow, uh, highlighted areas for improvement, and we've repeated this process on pretty much every feature of the app. And I'm excited to share with you today a sneak peek at the new and improved collector. Let's take a look. Applause. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that was just for fun. Yeah, that was a bit of fun. Um, just in case you missed some of that stuff, I'm going to just take you, take you through it quickly. Um, so firstly, we talked about starting collection. And you'll notice we've moved the collect button down to a more reachable and discoverable place. So tapping that will take me to the list of uh, feature types. And you'll notice we've grouped. The, the various feature types under the, the layer name, food trucks, rather than having that repeated information on every row. And I can still see my map, actually. I've got this little sliding panel that I can slide up and down to kind of transition between kind of a full screen view. But I can still see my map. And when I choose um, the type of food truck I want to collect, you'll see that I can actually see the feature on the map. Um, so this has given me like a lot of reinforcement about what's happened. You know, it's dropped the feature at my current location. And then I can use the little target to zoom and pan, and then I've got a big button that will let me update the location of that feature. I can swipe the panel up and start actually entering attributes. So I can fill these out on the same form. I don't have to transition to any other view. And I can quickly tap through my attributes to set, set, these, uh, set these values. And then we kept, obviously, the, the submit in the top right. And we've got the, the feedback that lets me know that the feature's been submitted OK. So I think we, we went through and we kind of addressed sort of each of these uh, areas of critique. Um, and we've been getting really good feedback from, from our beta users. So that is building great user experiences. What we talked about was how to incorporate design thinking into your development process, from framing the problem, developing a common understanding, activities for generating ideas, and finally making things tangible in the implementation phase. And when you leave here today and go back to your day to day, I'd encourage you to try out some of these techniques. Ultimately, building a great user experience is, is the responsibility of everyone on your development team and everyone on your, on your team can contribute. Thank you, and I'd like to take any questions now, if you have any.
Yes. Um, so yeah, the question is, do, I, do we think that uh, these, these concepts can translate into kind of a smaller organization? I, I would definitely argue yes, and you're totally right. Like Esri does have a lot of different teams, a lot of the different development teams working on different products. And the apps team is actually one sort of smallish team within that larger kind of organization. And I, I think the key thing is like testing things out you know, try out some of these techniques. And when I came back from that UI 18 conference, I was so energized. I really wanted to try out this design studio idea. And I think initially, like, you, you're always gonna get like a little bit of skepticism, or what are you, what are you making me do here? But actually, the, everyone involved in the design studio, that whole process, like, found it so rewarding. And actually, it was kind of cool that they felt like ownership over certain parts of the design. So. I think it, it definitely can. Yeah. Right. So, sorry. So the question was, you know, how many people typically are involved in design sprints, and what types of roles or um, employees you have in those sprints? So. Uh, we typically do ours with, I don't know, about I don't know, five to seven people maybe. I think that's sort of like what they advise. Um, in that first, in that second link there, there's a lot more information uh, at the Google Design Sprint website. But um, honestly, you can do it with, I, I think I've seen examples of up to at least 100 people so long as everyone is um, on board and you've got a sprint master sort of time boxing things and moving you along. Um, the other question was what kind of roles are involved. So obviously designers. We get developers, believe it or not. Um, we obviously get our product managers. I've even seen you can have folks from marketing, uh, business development, even legal, really, depending on what the actual problem is that you're trying to solve. Um, it just has to make, you just have to make sure that these are people in generally different roles, but they're gonna be working on the same product together when it actually comes time to building this thing, if, it, if it's gonna be a real thing. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Right. So, so how do you make it effective? I, I chime in there and say there's, there's two real things that need, need, you need to do. Um, the first is have a good facilitator. You know, get someone that really understands this process and can help the team members kind of go through it. The second thing would be to ensure you have somebody, uh, a decision maker, somebody that is a stakeholder in the project that can that can make some of these core decisions and, and guide um, the product into, a, into the right direction. So th those are the two main things that I think are the most important. Yes. Yeah, so have we had uh, geographically dispersed design teams? Well, it's interesting, I mean, I, I was actually working remotely throughout my history career. I, I worked remotely at one point. It is trickier. Um, it's definitely trickier to try and do one of these exercises. Um, some of the things we found kind of helpful is maybe not doing the sketching, you know, all together at once, maybe coming to one of these, you know, critique sessions with, with pre-canned sketches that you can kind of share out and then do the critique from there. That can make things a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, I, it is definitely, it feels more effective to get everyone together. And even if you have a remote team, you're probably gonna wanna be doing that anyway to try and like forge those connections between kind of remote members of your team. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks very much. Um, one more thing actually. Um, 
we decided to do a bunch of different content for this session from previous years. Um, we'd be really interested to know if you found it helpful. So if you could go on to the evaluation and let us know. If there was any part of this process that you feel that you'd like us to dive in more next, next year, or maybe you want us to switch back and talk about the technology, we'd be happy to do so. so you know, definitely fill out those evaluations. Yeah, we don't have a link here, but it's in the Esri Events app. And if you just select the session and scroll down to the bottom of the session details, it's, uh, it's in there. The questions are all there. Thanks, guys. Cool.